here today with uh, Judge Russell Nigro of the Court of Common Pleas of the First Judicial District and uh, former Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Thanks a lot for coming here to meet with us today, Judge. Uh, my pleasure. Okay. Now, with uh, some of these other interviews, I usually like to start at the beginning. So can you start out by telling us something about your background? Well, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, South Philadelphia specifically. Right. I went to, through the public school system, elementary, junior high school, and then high school at South Philadelphia High School. Um, my mom and dad, uh, we lived in the same house from uh, 1954 yeah. until they both passed in 2010. And uh, I was there until uh, I moved out to get married um, and went out and had my three children. Um, I went to um, undergraduate school at Temple University. Mm -hmm. um, took me a little extra time to get through because I had to work um, right. in order okay. to uh, earn enough money to get through. And then I went to Rutgers Law School in Camden. Uh, again, it was um, the cheapest ticket in town, <laughs> so it's the one I could afford. And it took me four years to get through because I had to work a year in order to uh, earn enough money to finish out. Sure. Um, I had also gotten married during that timeline while I was in law school, and we had our first baby while I was still in law school. So uh -huh. it made it economically and financially challenging. Sure. But, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I was able to uh, get my degree. Okay. What was uh, what did you start out doing as a as an attorney? <clears throat> well, um, I decided I only interviewed um, for for one job, mm -hmm. um, but. The, it was a friend of mine's dad who was the lead person in the firm. It was a small firm, but they did only estate work. Mm -hmm. And I knew I'd never almost probably ever get to court, and mm -hmm. I really wanted to try to get to court. So I turned the job down, and I decided to open up my own storefront. Oh. Um, and it was kind of, you know, clearly challenging, uh, not knowing if you were ever going to get any business. Yeah. Um, but my my ex-wife was still working and we rolled the dice and I felt that if I had taken a job and got used to a salary it would make it very hard to walk away right yeah so we started from ground zero I mean literally ground zero and I had a one-room um, office mm -hmm. in South Philadelphia um, a couple owned the house and decided to rent out one of their rooms yeah. as an office and so that was me. That was your firm. That, that was me. That was that was the firm. Uh, I went out and bought a uh, five set of the Keystone Practice, I, I, and I had an answering service because I couldn't afford a secretary. <laughs> and whenever anybody came in the door and told me about their what their problem was, yeah. I take you know very good notes, mm -hmm. and I said I'll get back to you. And then I would open up the Keystone Practice to figure okay. out exactly what I was supposed to do. Um, I, I compounded my dynamic in terms of making it more difficult for myself because in 1974, after only being out of law school, uh, I guess about eight months, um, I ran for United States Congress oh. um, in the first uh, congressional district. Um, I didn't have any chance of winning. I was running against a 14-term incumbent. Yeah. But uh, I felt that it would give me a little bit more exposure. Yeah, get your name out and get my name out and, yeah. and be able to hopefully generate some, you know, some work. Right. And it and it did work out that way. Oh, good. Yeah. So, um, the practice was basically a general practice. When you open up a storefront, you basically have to, tr you know, do this. And that. Yeah, you're yeah. like you're like the you're like the neighborhood hardware store. You're like the neighborhood <laughs> grocery store. Right. The people walk in, everybody's on a first name basis. They come in and tell their problems. They hang out in the lobby, you yeah. know what I mean, that kind of thing. And um, and so the practice, you know, developed. Um, I wound up getting a call from two fellows that I knew who had gone to law school who had a storefront about 10 blocks away from me. And they had full-time jobs. Uh, one worked in the defender's office and one worked in the DA's office. And they said, look, you're not working anywhere. Why don't you close your storefront down, move in with us. Yeah. We'll pay you a salary to come here. Oh. Since so you can cover the place all day for us, I see. and we'll share time at night, and we'll split the business up as it comes in. So that's what I did. So I went from having no steady paycheck to getting a steady paycheck, 
and still doing what I like to do, which yeah, was, was interact cool, with the people. Yeah, it worked out pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that was in you know I, I was with them from I guess 1975 to 81. Oh, and then, and then I, a good long time. You know, yeah, it was about six, seven years, and then yeah. I went back in my by myself again. Okay. I I just like being by myself. Yeah. Um, and then I worked for six years in a solo practice, mm -hmm. uh, but in the same location where we all were practicing. Oh, I see. Which okay. was uh, we had wound up buying a townhouse uh, on Spruce Street, the 1300 block of Spruce Street. Okay. And uh, did some renovation to it and. We kept our law offices there for a long time. In fact, the last of my partners uh, who was working out of there sold the building maybe about 18 months ago. Two, oh, okay. two years ago, yeah, huh. yeah. So it was uh, it was interesting, yeah. you know, to do it that way. It's sort of like uh, your partners, your your firm, and your partners were there the same way you and your family stayed in your original home. Not quite that long, but I mean, it lasted. For yeah, long. yeah, we, we, we got a very good buy. We did the renovations ourselves, you know, yeah. ourselves meaning we, we were the general contractors, if you will. Okay. And um, and we, it was a lot of nice space. It was yeah. good space. Yeah. It was owned by an insurance broker or something, and mm -hmm. and they uh, they wanted to sell it out, and we bought it for a good price and fixed it up and, and ran our practices out of there. Right. What uh, what uh, convinced you to become a judge, although you already had a bit of political experience? Well, I didn't do it for the money, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, because I remember when uh, I had talked to, I had talked to some political people in 84 with the idea I would run, I would run in 85, and then they told me, they were going to pass me over because I had other people that yeah. were going to be ahead of me. And that was okay because I had a very good lucrative practice at the time. Yeah. Um, and to answer your question, I decided to do it because I, I had done well in the private sector and I wanted to go and give time in the public sector. Okay. I mean, I wanted to make a contribution in the, in the public sector. Yeah. So um, it finally got around to 87 and um, I was supported by both political parties. So after I won the primary on both sides, uh, the late Governor Casey agreed to send my name over for appointment mm -hmm. to go on early. Okay. So I had to go in front of the you know the Senate Judiciary Committee. Right, right. And I went before them, and they said, "Well, okay, uh, if we confirm you tomorrow, can you start tomorrow?" <laughs> and I said, "In actuality, I can't." <laughs> And they said, why not? <laughs> I said, well, I have a whole lot of files. And they said, what do you mean you have a whole lot of files? I said, well, I have clients. Yeah. I don't have partners. I, yeah. you know, I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to do with all these people. Right. So they said, well, this is July. When do you think you can do it? And I said, well, and they said, if you don't go on by, by Labor Day, then we're going to keep you all the way to next year. So I was able to work out, you know, yeah. finding a home for all the different clients. Right. And I went on uh, in late August of 1987. But in front of the Judiciary Committee, besides that, yeah. I said, uh, after they were all done all their questions, I said, do you mind if I make a comment of some kind? He said, yeah, sure. What do you want to make? I said, well, you know, $65,000 a year <laughs> for a judicial position, I don't think you're going to attract the right kind of people, okay? And if you recall, they had just come out of that whole roofers thing. Oh, yeah, in, right. In, 80, in 85. Yeah. And around. I said, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to you're going to kind of put a carrot in front of certain people, you know, right. to think that, you know, they can't pay their bills maybe. Yeah. So they said, well, what do you think? What do you mean? I said, well, I make a lot more money. I'm taking a huge pay cut and I'm not saying you should pay me what I've been making. Okay. Right. right. But I think $65,000 is really kind of a low number. Yeah. Well, the next day they confirm me uh, for the appointment. Yeah. And the next day as well, they raised the judicial salary from sixty-five thousand to eighty thousand <laughs> dollars, I never got one thank you from any judge across the entire no. state. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's that, that's kind of the way it worked out. That's great. Now uh, uh, I'm going to ask you a more. Uh, I know you you practiced uh, you sat in civil trials and criminal, right? Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you a. a a general question about your experience in in those two fields and whatever other kind of cases you want to think about 
but were there any that that stood out or stand out in your mind that you might think that the public, people who might be looking at this, uh, might be interested? Well, you know, I was very fortunate in my eight and a half years. Uh, my bosses, if you will, uh, let me do a lot of different kind of assignments. Mm -hmm. So I got to sit not only in felony waiver in criminal, but then okay. I got major cases to do. Okay. And then in civil, I got to do not only the uh, motion court assignment, yeah. but I also got to be a team leader and then actually led all the civil judges oh. uh, in, in the program when we started day backward and day forward oh, right. yeah. uh, under Judge Bonavita Cola, President Judge Bonavita Cola's watch. Right. So, you know, I got a lot of opportunity to do a lot of nice things, yeah. which, which made it very uh, exciting yeah, sure. and fun, in addition to being hard work. Yeah. Um, on the criminal side, the hardest part of doing those cases was to do the bench trials in the sexual abuse cases. Uh -huh. Because a lot of times the lawyers, the defense lawyers, don't want to try those cases in front of juries. Yeah. Because if it's small children, okay, sure. who are the complainants, they just don't feel as if the, you know, the people can, the jurors can deal with it, right. okay? And yeah. so they might not necessarily get a fair trial. So it came to you. And so I did a lot of those cases, and they were extremely difficult to do. I imagine so. Um, I'm going to give you two examples of what I mean. Okay. Uh, at, so, so for whoever watches this, will get a feel for how difficult sometimes it is to be a, a trial judge yeah. and making the decisions. Good, excellent. There was a case where the defendant was charged with raping his 10-year-old niece. Yeah. So she got on the stand and she told her story and she said that her and her mom had been living at one location or had been a fire. Mm -hmm. Her sister, who was married to the defendant uh -huh. and who had two children of their own, said, look, you know, you're going to be displaced. You have nowhere to live. Why don't you come and live with us? Sure. So they had moved in, and the six of them were living there together. And one day when everybody was out of the house, except for the complaint the 10-year-old girl yeah. and her uncle, the uncle, uncle raped her. Okay. And that was her story. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, you don't have any video you know yeah. there's no eyewitnesses to what was going on yeah. and so at that point the defense lawyer put the defendant on the stand and he mm -hmm. told the story and he basically said it never happened yeah so you know I after both lawyers were done all their questioning and yeah. when you do a bench trial you can ask questions it's different than when you're doing a jury because right. you have to be the fact finder and decider sure okay at the end so I asked him I said um, you know, sir, I, I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed. Why would your niece, who you invited into the house, yeah. decide to go make these charges against you right. unless they were true? And he goes, I have no idea, Your Honor. He looked dead at me and he said, I have no idea, Your Honor. Because we invited her, well, I invited her and her mom in and we put a roof over their heads and we put food on the table. Yeah. And whenever we had a birthday party for one of my little girls, we had one for for my niece and you know we all went to the park together and we all did right. this together he says in actuality i treated her just like i treated my own two daughters yeah so i don't know why she's doing this well i had to make a decision yeah. and i found him guilty okay all right now i gave him a a, a subpoena yeah. to uh, come back in six weeks he would do a pretrial sentencing and Right. You know, pretrial mental health evaluation and come back for the sentencing. So he got his subpoena to sign and he left with his lawyer. And about 15 minutes later, as I'm looking through what we're going to do next in the next case, lo and behold, the defense lawyer and the defendant are standing at the bar to court. Hmm. And I said to the DA, well, what do we have here? What, is there a problem with the date? Is there a problem with something? Yeah. He says, no, he, he's, uh, he's here to plead guilty. I said, well, we already had his trial. He, he's already been found guilty. No, he's here to plead guilty on something else. I said, what is he going to plead guilty to? He's pleading guilty to two other counts of rape. Uh, and the no. complaints, complainants were his two daughters. The only thing, honestly, like yes, uh, the only thing that he said that was truthful was I treated my niece just like I treated my two daughters. Yeah. Isn't that terrible? Badly. Yeah. I mean, Jeez. so um, 
you know how much better I slept that night knowing that I yeah, made the right, right decision? decision? Because, you know, as the trial judge, you can't know, and the jury wouldn't know, that he had these other charges right. that were out there. Because he's, he's being charged only with the one rape. He gets a tr fair trial with no other evidence coming in yeah. other than what about that case. And uh, I'm so glad that I was able to make the decision that I made. Yeah, that's a rare occasion when you can be affirmed you know, by the defendant and, the, and yeah. his attorney. Right. Now, know. on the flip side, I did a case where a dance instructor um, was charged with molesting one of her a female dance instructor, yeah. was charged with molesting one of her female students okay. at various locations, both out of state and within the state, on trips that they would go on. Okay, right. So the young girl testified. She was probably about 14, 15 years old. And she told this long story about how they would go different places and the various things that a teacher would do to her. Oh. And then the teacher took the stand and denied it all. Okay, yeah. and. Uh, the jury room, the, the courtroom was packed because they were, it, she was like a well-known dance instructor down in South Philadelphia. A lot yeah. of people knew her. Okay. The courtroom got packed to watch the proceedings. Right. There were a lot of family members for both sides, to both the complainant and the defendant. Yeah. And they brought in, I don't know how many character witnesses. Like there must have been at least 10 or 15 uh, character wow. witnesses yeah. to testify. At the end of the day, I found the defendant not guilty. And afterwards, the DA came to me and said, Your Honor, we don't have a problem with your decision yeah. because there was a lot of evidence that didn't come into the case about her making charges against a male neighbor across the street that he molested her, oh, okay? And the oh. fact that her and her brother might have been doing some things sexually with each other yeah. about the father, okay, being molested as a child when he was young. And they went through all this stuff, okay? Yeah. And so again... I felt good that I had made the decision right. that I made. Just as the last part of the equation, about two weeks later, I was in somewhere and one of the persons who had come in as a character witness came up to me and said, Judge, I just want you to know ah, that was a really tough decision you had to make. Yeah. I testified on behalf of the defendant yeah. as a character witness, right. but you know, that was really a hard case, even though I testified yeah. as a character witness. It was hard for you know me to decide what right. I thought was happening. Okay. So I felt good about that. Yeah, sure. And it must. I mean, both of the cases. Uh, you know, when you're when you're faced with that kind of, it's nothing less than a tragedy, and you have to come up with some sort of, and as a fact finder, you have to come up with some element of justice somewhere and find that right place. Right. And. Right. Uh, so it's it's. I'm glad it worked out well. Yeah, it was good to be. It was good to be uh, told. Yeah. In one fashion or another, that right. you made the right decision. Yeah. Um, because you know, at the end of the day, you know, if they're found guilty, they're going to get a substantial sentence. Sure. It's not going to be. They're going to get a week. You know, in, right. the, in the Pocono Mountains. Yeah. Okay. So. Wow. Um, uh, I was uh, wondering. Uh, one of the questions I've been asking is if there's. Anybody who uh, was a sort of a standout in your life, maybe somebody who's famous or not famous, who you looked up to and you admired, maybe wanted to emulate, somebody that stands out in your mind over your career? Well, you know, there was nobody really in the law, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't discuss, decide until very late in my undergraduate that I, to go to law school. Okay. Um, I had not... My family didn't have any lawyers in it. Mm -hmm. um, I was the first person actually to go to college on either side, okay, yeah. from my generation. Okay. So there was no, there wasn't anybody that um, I watched as a lawyer and said yeah. I want to emulate or I want right. to follow in the footsteps. Um, the closest would have been the late Judge Cipriani, yeah. uh, who who um, I got my first haircuts, okay, by you know by his <laughs> by his dad, you know, I mean, and yeah. up the up the street, but. Um, but I never went through that, um, I never worked in a law firm while I was going to law school. Yeah. Um, I really couldn't afford to work in a law firm. I needed to go out and make, you know, real money. Yeah, okay. Right. And they kind of wanted to just have you in <laughs> service, for law service, school. service, right, you know, right, right. uh, and I had to support a family and then yeah. go for law school. Um, but, you know, I guess, you know, the, the person that, 
I appreciate, you know, was my late father, okay, yeah. who worked his butt off all his life okay. and always would tell me, you know, you're never going to get anywhere unless you're willing to work for it. Yeah. Nobody's going to hand it to you for, for, for free. Yeah. And, um, and it sounds like you have been doing that. Yeah, I've, I've worked I've worked since I was 16 years old in yeah. one fashion or another right. in a full-time job. Sometimes I'd work 70, 80 hour weeks. Okay. I mean, and, yeah. you know, I mean, that's just the very nature of what I am. Yeah. Um, and so I'm still doing it to some degree. Get there uh, early, leave very late. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, when I first started my law firm, you know, the law office, you know, I got there 8.30 in the morning. Yeah. And then I was there till 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night because right. you never knew who was going to come off the street right, right. and talk to you. Or so, at what time. Yeah. Or what, what time, yeah. yeah. Well, they, would, you know, they, they worked all day. They weren't coming in until nighttime. Right. So it's, I never had a problem with working hard. Right. Um, and I've been very fortunate that I've been rewarded in many different ways. Yeah. But I think it goes back to being taught as a kid from my, both my mom and my dad, okay, yeah. that you got to, you got to work hard. You got to get an education, and you have to work hard. Right. Now, what what did your dad uh, work at? My father, my and, and actually, it was not my biological father. I won't get into the whole story no. of my my my. Whatever my you like. But he had adopted me when I was five years old. Yeah. This is the only father I really knew. Sure. Um, he worked for the Amalgamated Clothing Workers. He worked forty six years, from the time he dropped out of high school at sixteen years old, because yeah. his dad said, "You have to go bring money into the house. You can't go get educated." Yeah. My dad went the opposite way with me and okay. wanted me to get educated. Yeah, uh, and he worked until he he went out on Social Security early at, at sixty two years old, okay. uh, and he had after forty six years of wonderful service. Yeah, he got a a, a monster eighty eight dollars a month. Okay, wow. as a pension. Pension. Okay, uh, so <laughs> that that was another way of letting me know what yeah. are you doing? Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> go get yourself educated. So yeah. he oh yeah yeah, yeah. He, he worked he worked for the amalgamated clothing workers. Okay. Um, you know, for many years. A long time. A yeah. long time. A long yeah. time. Now, I, we kind of glossed over the uh, judicial career there, and I just mentioned a couple of things that you had done. So I'd like you to tell us some more about your, your career in the judiciary. Okay. Um, well, uh, as you know, I served eight and a half years on the trial bench, and then I served 10 years on the Supreme Court. Yeah. And um, when I started out on the Supreme Court, People would ask me, you know, lawyer friends of mine, you know, yeah. how's it different? And in actuality, you're pretty much cloistered when you're on the Supreme Court. Okay. You don't interact with very many lawyers. It's only at the, you know, at the argument sessions, and there's mm -hmm. a limited number of them. Most of the time, you're spending, you know, going over aliquoted petitions and going over opinions with your law clerks. Yeah. Um, when you're on the trial bench, you're, you're in an assignment, whether it be criminal, civil, family. You're interacting with the lawyers all the time. Right. I had the opportunity to have both bench trials and jury trials, and I did it both criminal and civil. Yeah. So there's a lot of fun. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of interaction, and it's much more sedate. Okay, when you're on the Supreme Court, I had kidded all the time that if I had had somebody gave me my choice about what to do, I would have served six months on the trial bench and six months on the Supreme <laughs> Court and got the best of both worlds. But right. of course, it doesn't work that way. No. Uh, but it was it was. Um, it was a pretty exciting time. I mean, um, very few people get the opportunity to serve on the Supreme Court. Sure. There's still been less than 200 in the, in effect, the 300 years of, right. the, of, yeah. the, of the of the court itself. Um, so it was kind of you know kind of cool okay, yeah. to, to to do that. I'll say, yeah. Uh, it's like know, the pinnacle of the, of the profession. Yeah, I mean, it was it was nice. I mean, it was yeah. nice to be able to go there. I think my only my only disappointment, yeah. okay, was the fact that I didn't get to serve as the Chief Justice. Yeah. It would have happened had I won the retention. I didn't win the retention for nothing I did personally wrong, right. I know. you know, but it was just one of those things. And yeah. uh, that's kind of the only thing, you know, I missed out on. Right. Um, I would have liked to see my mom and dad be able to see that, right. you know, yeah. but it didn't, it just didn't work out. Yeah. Um, but all in all, I mean, I have, you know, I've had a great judicial career and now actually I've gone full circle. Right. Because I'm back working again these last 10, 11 years in a mediation, arbitration practice. Oh. I do, uh, I do just discovery master stuff for the mm -hmm. for the judges. Okay. Uh, you know, I do some receivership stuff for the judges in the court in the court system, and 
I get to interact with a bunch of lawyers now. Right, again, right, back to that. Which is exactly yeah. where I used to be. Okay. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of fun. Um, you know, I, I kid all the lawyers when I do the mediations right. that in the old days when I was on the court and I wanted to, and I was very proactive to try to settle cases. Right. Well, I had the ability to have a black robe, the ability to be able to call the sheriffs to lock them up if they right. didn't settle. Yeah. Now I have to just be a charming guy, okay? <laughs> and it makes it a little hard. I'm not really a charming guy. I mean, so, right. yeah, yeah. so it's, but that's, that, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of fun, and it's very financially rewarding too. I mean, oh, they yeah. all pay me uh, yeah. to do it, and um, and we have a lot of success, okay? And um, so I you guess more it, or less run the mediation uh, part. I mean, the the case. Yeah, I, I, what I do is is basically lawyers call me. My clients are lawyers, right. okay. And they'll call me up and say, look, we have this case, it's in the court system, we'd like to try to see if we can settle it without all the cost of litigation. Right. You know, because jury trials are pretty expensive in this on the civil side, especially if the case is more complicated. Sure. Uh, the expert expenses alone could run you $100,000. Okay. All right, so they come to mediation, they give me their memos, I read the material, I get a game plan on what I think really the case, where it should go, yeah. and I try to convince you know the two sides sometimes the three or four sides okay what you know what they should do right. they're free to walk away and not follow the recommendation but um, I have a very high success rate of settlements okay you know above 90 percent um, and I never advertise I get all my business from just word of mouth, word of mouth. I mean people just simply you know call up which is which is really nice right and it's yeah. probably ideal for the for the from the court system standpoint because you're removing cases from from the docket, more or less, and coming to a, a settlement uh, without using uh, judge time and uh, you know personnel and the rest of it. Oh, exactly. There's yeah. no question about it. I think, look, the, the judges have plenty of cases to try to do. So if you can eliminate some of the inventory, it's yeah. just going to make it much more, you know, practical and reasonable right. you know, to, to survive in the system. Right now, I'm doing the last four years, I guess, five, four, four and a half years, I'm doing a lot of the asbestos cases. Yeah. So okay. I've been mediating a lot of those cases with uh, the various, you know, members of the bar who specialize just in that. There's, okay. there's maybe uh, 10 plaintiff's firms, okay, and yeah. maybe 10 or so defense firms, and, mm. and they specialize in doing a lot of the mediation work. Okay. And so we've been doing it for the last four and a half years. Very few of the cases have started trial. Okay. And there's been only maybe at best five verdicts in oh. that in that timeline with all the inventory. Oh, man. So it's worked out pretty good. It has. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great batting average, pardon me, so to speak. Um, I uh, you mentioned the Supreme Court in your election, and uh, I, I wanted to ask you also what was your proudest moment or moments, if there are, that uh, as a judge. Well, I, you know. Um, I'd have to say it this way. Uh, I was able to preside over the marriage of my oldest daughter yeah. in my black robe. Huh. My son walked her down the aisle. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that was pretty exciting to be able to do that. Right. Um, my second daughter chose to have a big wedding and, and be in a church and whatever, and that, right. was, that was fine too. Um, you know, I'm, so I got to walk her down the aisle. Yeah, right. Um, That's good. My stepson, who I knew since he was three years old, um, I married him as well. Yeah. Okay, so that was kind of cool to yeah. do that. Right. Uh, and then ranked right there, I think, is the day of my swearing in uh, to the Supreme Court. Right. Um, many, many of the judges that I had served with in the Court of Common Pleas dressed up in, in their robes yeah. and, and you know had a procession into the courtroom um, I had my entire family there except for my late brother and so it was nice to be able to experience that with friends and relatives sure. and the judges who I had worked with as peers I think that was probably a, you know ranks right up there right but you notice that it ranks right up there with with three other occasions that were very personal to you too. Right, exactly. So that the family is very important. Oh, there's no, there's no question about that. Yeah. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, you know, I only had one uh, sibling. My brother passed away many, many years ago. Yeah. Um, right. And 
it, you know, it was very difficult for my mom and dad. It was, um, we were quite a number of years apart. I was 14 years older than him. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I kind of almost feel as if I wanted to live a portion of my life and get hopefully success in my life for what he didn't get to do. I see, yeah. Um, because he passed away at 12 years old. Uh -huh. And so it was, that was always kind of a factor in driving me to it. I mean, you went back and said, you know, kind of an inspirational kind right. of thing. Yeah. It was less about having some mentor in the law that kind of worked me. Yeah. It was more about coming from where I came from and then also the loss of my brother. Right. Uh, to try to go and, and live a part of my life for him. More or less dedicated you know, to him, yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember at the swearing in, after I, all the festivities, all the speeches from everybody, and then right. I spoke, and um, you know, I, I said at the end, okay, you know, hey Frank, that was his name. Yeah. You know, we finally got there. Okay, so yeah. so it was, you know, he wasn't there, but mom and dad were there. Yeah. The kids were there. Okay. And he was there in spirit. He was there in spirit. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's exactly. great. Yep. That shows the kind of a man you are. Um, is there uh, anything else that uh, you might want to share with us today? Well, you know, I, it, to practice a lot, I, I get questioned all the time about, you know, what was it like when you started out? Yeah, okay, and, I should have been asked that. Yeah, and what's it like to, today? Yeah. Um, there's no question that it's far more competitive today than okay. it was back then. I mean, it's not to mean that lawyers weren't aggressive and wanted to win for their clients yeah. you know 50 years ago right. but it's it's that there's so many more lawyers that are out there when i started out there were three thousand members of the philly bar association okay. it's probably twenty thousand yeah, members right. are now okay the the amount of population is basically the same so they're vying for the same amount of business but far more people that trying to survive yeah. okay in the environment uh, I think what it does then is it makes the lawyers to some degree, you know, a little less nice to each other. Mm, I get it. Yeah, there's there's a lot more nastiness that comes up. I noticed it when I first went on the bench in '87. Yeah. That lawyers would fight with each other right in front of me, you know, in the courtroom, and I literally saw them throw things at each other. Uh. And I'm saying to myself, <laughs> what is that? You know. Um, and I think it's a lot of it stems from the fact that um, they're vying for a limited amount of business. Yeah. And it's very, very doggy dog almost out there, which is unfortunate, yeah. okay, that it's that way. It's not to disparage them on their ability to, to be professionals. Yeah. It's just that that element makes it a little bit more aggressive be, between them, yeah. uh, which is which is unfortunate. And And the advertisement part of it, I think it was wrong for the United States Supreme Court to ever allow them to advertise. That's great that you're talking about this. Because I think what it did is it it stopped them from being a high-level profession. Yeah. And it made them no different to some degree than people who sell cars on TV. And the other advertisements. And all the other advertisements they go yeah. on. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, okay, right. for the profession. I understand why they did it. Yeah. But I don't I thought it was a bad decision to go down that road. Um, it's kind of like a symbol of, of what you were talking about with the aggressive approach and uh, the supply and demand aspect. So, exactly, yeah. because the national advertisers gobble up a lot of business in a lot of different jurisdictions, mm -hmm. which then makes it difficult for the lawyers who are only in that jurisdiction okay. to further compete. Right. I know it happens, for example, in the asbestos program. Yeah. You have a a half dozen that uh, national advertisers well whatever cases they pick up out of philly is taking away from a philadelphia based lawyer right so then the com competition becomes that much greater right okay amongst those that are here and which i think like is a chain unfair. law firm oh yeah right exactly there. exactly yeah. Uh, in fact they do it in a guise sometimes that doesn't even indicate that they're a law Firm. Yeah, I noticed that. You have to look at the little fine print. Down what they the do is they tell the people, oh, call us if you think you have a problem. Yeah. When you call, 
and you give your name and address and personal information, yeah. the next thing you know, a lawyer is contacting you, <laughs> okay, from the whatever area it happens to be around the country, right. which I think is, you know, I, I find to be yeah. a little bit the state's fault. Right. And, and I appreciate the fact that you're bringing that up. And I assume that the opposite was true or something like that when you began, say, practicing law yourself, that things were more, people were more amenable and more genteel. Yeah, I think for the most part, back then in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, before I went on, I should say the early 80s, right. before I went yeah. on the bench in 87, um, you could probably have a handshake with most lawyers. Yeah. Okay, you didn't need to. To write a letter, you didn't need to go put it on voicemail. You didn't need to, well, of course, you have emails now. You didn't yeah. have it back then. Right. But you could pretty much shake hands, and, and everybody lived up to what they said they would do. Good. It's a different ball game today. Okay. A lot of lawyers tell me that if they don't put it in writing, if they don't lock the person in on the other side, yeah. that the other side may go wherever they feel like going. If it's not recorded. It's yeah, not that's, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Is there is there anything else that you might want to talk about to us today? No, I mean, it's just, I've been, uh, you know, in the big picture, I've been very, very fortunate in my, in my whole life. My whole life, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, yeah. you know, look, I, I got to be here, I'm seven, I'm 70 years old now, okay? okay? So, I got to be here on this planet 58 years more than my late brother did. Yeah, right. Where, where am I going to complain about right. what I've had and what I've done, and yeah. I've made it all the way right. to Supreme Court. I've been, you know, I've done pretty well financially. Um, I get to live in Scottsdale, Arizona now, okay, and, and uh, you know, part-time in, in, at the Jersey Shore. Yeah. Uh, you know, where am I going to complain? I got three healthy kids. I got six healthy granddaughters. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't know where I, you know, I, I can complain about anything. Right. You know, everybody can say, oh, I wish this term would have worked a little better over here or over there. Yeah, yeah sure, but in a big picture, I'm way better off than most people on the planet and have been all the way through the process. So, right. you know, I'm pretty much happy about it. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for, for being with us today. It's my pleasure.